Hey, well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our industry roundtable. I want to thank our guest panelists and our moderator, uh, Avant, Talaris, AppSmart, and Sandler Partners. And uh, thank you again for joining us. We have our CEO, Avi Lonstein, who would like to say a few words uh, to welcome everybody. Avi? All right. Well, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. I probably should just delay my talk for another 30 seconds as I watch the numbers pop up at the bottom here, but I'm sure everyone will want to keep moving. So um, first of all, I want to personally uh, welcome our world-class panel of channel leaders uh, who represent the absolutely largest technology service brokers in the channel today. And um, you can imagine just how busy their schedules are, uh, but they have all committed to come together for this webinar uh, with one common purpose. And that is to help each of you, our mutual partners, succeed and thrive in the market. Airspring is and always has been a 100% channel focused company. Uh, the channel is our lifeblood and we care deeply about each of our partners. For 21 years, we've been committed to setting the standard for the best channel program in the industry bar none. We believe in the highest level of integrity and on delivering on the promises that we make. And that is what sets us apart. Now, I'm sure you're following the news and the channel is morphing at a blistering pace, as is evident by the numerous acquisitions and combinations in the space and frankly, by the increased interest of the financial and service provider communities in the success of the channel. Uh, over the last few years, the channel is being seen as the preferred method of engagement with small, mid-size and large enterprises and is undeniably in high growth mode. And it is, uh, is part of the success story is what each and every one of you here uh, on this webinar today is doing. So I'm really excited to hear the insights from our incredible panel. Without further ado, I'm gonna get the show on the road and Ellen, if you can take it from here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Avi. So our panelists probably don't need an introduction, but I'm going to do it anyway. On the upper right-hand corner, we have Drew Lidecker, who as you know is the president and co-founder of Avant. And then we circle around to um, Justin Morano, who is the chief revenue officer for the channel with Sandler. In the middle, we have Rene Bergeron, who is the senior VP and general manager at AppSmart. And then Adam Edwards, CEO of Tolaris. In the upper left-hand corner, we have our moderator, which is Josh Anderson. Uh, unfortunately, Peter Radizewski, um, had a personal emergency and could not be here today. So Josh is gonna be our moderator and he is CEO of Acuity Technologies. And some of you may know Josh. So that means I'm gonna let Josh take over from here and uh, tell us a little bit about himself too real quickly and we'll get underway with our questions. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks Ellen, thanks Avi. Um, big thanks to Airspring for putting this together. And of course, to the panelists for sharing their time today. Again, I'm Josh Anderson, CEO of Acuity Technologies. Um, I've personally been in the indirect channel for, I was doing the math, um, a little over 25 years, uh, much like everybody else on this call probably. Um, and uh, although we recently sold our carrier business earlier this year, we remain involved in the channel as a uh, partner ourselves and a provider of mobility managed services. So i um, really excited to talk to everybody today. So let's go ahead and get this started. Um, got a couple of questions that we're going to run through with the panelists. And I think uh, a good first one is, um, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of changes over the last three years in the channel, uh, much more emphasis on apps and the cloud. There have been a few carrier shakeups, partner consolidation. Uh, looking forward, I'm curious to hear how our panelists think the technology brokerage space is going to look three years from now. So, Drew, maybe you can, uh, you can start us off on that. Sure. Um, you know, it's going to look a lot different. I can tell you that, um, you know, if there's one constant and it's something that I've been predicting for a long time, it's change. It's the only consistent thing that has happened in our indirect channel for a very long time and change is happening faster and faster. But at the end of the day, you know, 
when you think about the trusted advisor movement, which it's truly a movement, and I think that's probably half the reason why we're all on this call today, the trusted advisor is getting a bigger seat at the table than they've ever had in history. But it's really because they're the only ones that can navigate this incredibly explosive market of change. And every IT staff today is tasked with new objectives that they've never had in the past. And I think COVID accelerated everything. And one of the things that I'm hearing the most, uh, you know, as I go out and speak around the world at different IT organizations is as a service is now number one priority for every IT staff. And only the trusted advisor has the capabilities to sort through the confusion that disruption is creating for every company on the planet. And the trusted advisor seat has grown incredibly large. They are extremely powerful now because they can navigate this massive ecosystem of change and of choice. You know, when I grew up in the industry, you know, it was really about the big blues, the big blues, you know, big safe companies to do business with. Today, if you're doing business with a lot of the big safe giant companies that exist out there, you're not taking advantage of the market. And the trusted advisor is helping really every IT organization make the moves that are going to benefit their companies, not to just band-aid and do IT things, but to fundamentally change those companies both inside and outside. And I think collectively this group here, this panel that we brought together, uh, we're the platforms for the future that are helping the trusted advisors navigate and keep pace with that change. I think that transformation is, you know, as you touched on, Drew, is a, uh, is a massive opportunity, but also a massive threat um, for all channel partners. Because what we're observing is that end customers, businesses want to work with fewer partners and they want these partners to be um, all encompassing when it comes to the solution that they provide. And so what we're seeing is a lot of channel partners that are taking advantage of that and they're expanding, as you pointed out, into cloud and other areas. But we're also seeing um, a, a clash of the different channel. We're seeing the resellers, the VARs and the MSPs expand into telecommunication in the same way that the traditional telecommunication agents are expanding into cloud and infrastructure related solution. And there's also another channel with the system integrators that are starting to play in here. So I think that the, the transformation we're seeing, which is starting at the end customer level, I think you're absolutely right, Drew. It's also forcing all the channel partners to transform and it's creating a, a new type of, of competition within the indirect channel, which is gonna be really interesting in terms of the next three years. I actually agree 100% with you. We all are all about transformation. I, I think it's actually going to accelerate in the next few years. Um, I, I definitely agree with my fellow panelist, Josh. Uh, we've been evolving so quickly. And if you focus on what's happened most recently, Adam and I are probably going to work for Andrew and Renee soon. Um, <laughs> you know, the, the, the TSB space is, is going to get a little bit smaller. And, we're, you know, we're seeing that with a lot of acquisitions that are happening. We've always seen acquisitions on the provider side, and we still see that today. And now we're seeing it on the TSB side uh, and it's starting to flow downstream to the partner side. So uh, while there's so many more newer partners coming into this ecosystem that each of us have, uh, specifically in the managed services space and the professional services space that we didn't historically work with, um, we're seeing a lot of those newer partners merge with some of the existing more tenured folks. Yeah, that, it's, I'm glad you mentioned that because you know, speaking of consolidation, um, you know, that at least lately has been driven in many cases by private equity money. And I'm, I'm curious to, to know for those of you that, that have participated in that, what effect that PE involvement had on the channel and technology brokers in general. Adam, what are your thoughts on that? Um, we actually sought private equity money several years ago, probably four years ago or so. I started to search um, really because, I mean, these are investors who are just professionals at aligning with the business and their goals and helping lift it up because they want to return on their investment. Um, we found a great partner. In fact, I had a hallway conversation at Channel Partners with Ian and said, hey, how, you know, how's life with private equity? He said, actually fantastic. And I, my response was, I feel the same. 
Uh, we've got smart people asking smart questions. Have you considered this? Uh, why wouldn't you offer that? What if they would like this? Uh, these are really qualified investors. I've seen a lot of businesses and to have them as a partner has been a big, uh, I think, boost to us and uh, to what we're able to offer. But if you also look at the dynamic of what is taking place to build something of true scale, and that's what these are. As a brokerage, as a business of scale, look at, uh, you want to look at business of scale, look at railroads, look at airlines, uh, look at Amazon. These are very high fixed cost companies, low variable costs. And what that means is you, the more you aggregate scale, size, you can turn around and produce value. The number of lines of code you can create for partners, uh, the reduced interest rates on your lending or financial resources for them, uh, the way you can augment demand gen, do all sorts of things to help them build their business. But at the end of the day, that's, that's who we are, is we're trying to enable partners in building their business. And when you have scale, which I think private equity has done a good job in, in allowing, creating you know, more of this environment of consolidation, you can provide value. So I think AppSmart uh, you know, took place in this early on and uh, acquired several companies. You saw Avance move, uh, it was just announced, uh, this acquisition, that's not gonna slow down. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe there's gonna be a very limited number, like uh, Justin said, uh, there's gonna be a very limited number of uh, brokerages, but they're going to produce a very high amount of value. And that's what I'm excited about is seeing that value uh, equation tick up in favor of the partners. That's the real win here. Hmm. I totally yeah, I agree. Uh, I, I, I actually think that, you know, all this private equity that's coming into the channel is great news for channel partner because, you know, when I see any of the investments that have taken place, whether it's Savant or Tolaris or, or anybody else or us, nobody's cashing out. Everybody's doubling down on investment, is expanding on the tool sets that they're making available for partner, expanding the catalog, expanding the sales support, sales engineering capability. And at the end of the day, the channel partner benefits from this. So I think it's great news for partners. Yeah, you asked a question earlier, you know, what's it going to look like in three years from now? And I said, it's going to be vastly different. It's, it really is. And I think the, the trusted advisor community that leans into all of us the most to take advantage of the opportunity that we all could not have. I mean, I think Adam and I have talked about this. We never dreamt it would be this crazy, this big um, now. I mean, it is truly happening right now. And I think, you know, to Adam's point too, smart money is what we call private equity money. When smart money recognizes something in explosive growth mode, and they see all the intangibles for really smart businesses, that's what's happening. And the investment into companies and platforms like us allows that community to get even larger. And so to all the trusted advisors that are listening to us, you know, I think you should be cheering this on in, in so many ways, because it's only going to help fuel the growth of the entire industry 10x compared to what we could have done on our own. And I think that the smart money that's recognizing that right now, they're also saying that, you know, the next gen decision making in IT is going to come from the trusted advisors. Those trusted advisors are the ones that fuel our platforms. And so we must keep pace uh, with this ever expanding market. And I think it couldn't be a more exciting time for everybody to participate in it. So I had a quick uh, follow up question there. You know, Adam, when you were talking, you mentioned um, that this is an industry that's well suited to scale because um, it's predominantly fixed costs and less variable costs. And I think that for, you know, I'm curious to hear whether this is the same for everybody on the panel, but I, I think that is perhaps unique to the Telaris model. You guys have historically been very software and systems driven. Um, I don't know if that's necessarily the case for all brokerages. So I'm, I'm curious as, you know, as things do scale, you know, do, do you guys anticipate that you are going to be able to keep the variable costs from scaling proportionately? And, and what is that going to mean for the experience of the partner, you know, particularly the partner that may have been accustomed historically to kind of one-on-one -on -one work with a, a uh, rep or counterpart within their master or their, their TSB. I'll jump in. I, uh, 
Yeah, I, I totally agree with Adam. It is a business where scale matters because there's a sizable um, set of fixed costs. Um, you know, for example, we're a platform company and, you know, with 450 engineers, um, the more business going through the platform, obviously, you know, helps the profile, the financial profile of the company. But I think it's also uh, misleading to think that, you know, the more we bring systems and platforms and automation, you know, it means less touch point, it means less live support for partners. I think the platform and the technology is really there to bring automation and offer self-service for partners who are interesting and more and more leveraging these capabilities. But at the end of the day, it's also allowing us to have our staff uh, more available in, in, in partner facing roles. Um, because some of the uh, more um, uh, laborious tasks, behind the scene tasks can be handled through the technology. So um, it's, it's definitely a game of scale in our business as it is in, uh, in Talaris. And you know, I'm curious to see what other panels, panelists think hey, about. Let, let me jump in there and just address something real quick, Josh, because you mentioned you know, kind of that, that, that hometown feel of that one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and I want to address that because that doesn't go away. But I think what we're talking about is really, you know, scale that can address things, uh, problems that shouldn't exist. Nobody complains that they can't wait in line to talk to a bank teller anymore. I mean, th that would infuriate me if I had to go wait like I used to with my father to deposit his paycheck on mm -hmm. Friday so we could have money to spend on the weekend. You know, you've got a mobile app you're happy with. And you'd be frustrated to go wait in line. That's a leap forward in technology. And that's what technology does. It, you shouldn't have to talk to a person about pricing or fiber maps or, or escalations or things like that. But what I will talk to a bank about is I will go and sit down and have a face-to-face -face of, hey, I'm thinking of investing in a certain area. Let's go talk to your private bank. And think about growing my wealth in some area. And mm -hmm. I think that's what a brokerage can do is let's automate all the headache stuff or the bank teller things, but then let's add value. The sit down relationship still matters. We can use the heft to escalate things or to help partners make good business decisions or demand or get educated. So much can be automated. That still doesn't take away from the relationship. I think you still focus on the relationship, but the relationship doesn't have to be based on, hey, we're going to run a price quote for you. Yeah, Josh, right. you know, my, my peers are all right. We, we've all invested in technology to empower our partners to be as independent and self-sufficient as they can be. Um, but at the core of this business, it's, it's a relationship business. And there's always going to be resources in place uh, that are there to handhold partners that need that little bit of extra handholding to bridge the gap from where they are today to being more independent and self-sufficient. As we talked about so many newer partners entering our ecosystems over the last few years and the years to come, um, there needs to be a transition phase from where they are to where we know they could be. Except yeah, and I'll just, I'll just end. I mean, you know, you can have the greatest technology in the world and you can try to make the most scalable product in the entire world, but it's the people <laughs> that make it dance, that's it. So. That's never going away in this business uh, in any time, in any way uh, that I can see. Uh, what we do is complex as can be, and that is good. And that's good for the trusted advisors, and that's good for everybody in this business. Um, I think it's when the technology meets the people and that comes together, and the trusted advisors are able to use that people and technology in a way that they never could have imagined so that the end customer can get the results that they're looking for. I go back to what I said earlier, there's never been more choice than there is today, right? We all represent hundreds of service providers that are doing one to two to three things better than any IT staff could do on their own. But it's when we have technology that allows the trusted advisors to scale, to differentiate themselves. You know, we are heavily investing in things like our Pathfinder tool, which is a front facing you know, in front of the CIO, in front of the CTO technology to describe what the trusted advisor truly is capable of doing. But matching that with engineers who are subject matter experts that study the ins and the outs of a particular vertical, that is not going away. And the reason that's not going away is because there's more choice every day of new service disruptors that are coming on board. Uh, and so I think that the investments that smart money is making into us 
is helping accelerate those two coming together. You know, I think about evelocity. We made up this word this year called evelocity, which is really evolution meets velocity. If you're not evolving, you're dying. And I think that the trusted advisors that are evolving out there today, utilizing all of these tools that we all build, uh, our smart engineers, our people on the back end, things like research and analytics that you know we are creating as well. Um, those are the things that are going to combine in the future that I think in three years from now, back to that earlier question, you'll see a greater number of trusted advisors leveraging those platforms uh, in front of the end customer. Interesting. So um, one of the things that, um, to shift gears a little bit here, one of the things that I, I think maybe mentioned earlier was um, the, the phrase marketplace, the, the term marketplace. And I think there's uh, there's been some talk of drives to build marketplaces. And I'm, I'm curious to understand how partners have responded to that and and whether or not you guys have seen a change in either engagement or utilization like, like is the concept of a marketplace more marketing buzz or is it is it actually proving to to drive value to your partners adam you know, I think there is a lot of buzz around marketplace. I think people are using it uh, kind of a, you know, back in the 2000s, you'd add .com to your uh, company name to, to boost the uh, enterprise value 20%. Uh, and I think marketplace has much become a buzzword where you've got marketplaces uh, such as, you know, what, what AppSmart has built. I think they actually built an, a, a, a marketplace where people can go in and, and uh, you know, digitally curate and uh, procure. Uh, but I also think when you talk marketplace, it's, you know, it, it's slippery, you know, you, you, you start including things like the other offerings uh, that partners uh, are, are able to uh, market and sell. And I think what we've got to recognize is that, you know, Drew said an important thing, which is complexity. I think a lot of times on a marketplace, you know, a VAR and MSP who is reselling just seats and licenses may want to manage it through a marketplace or a licensed procurement engine is what I would think of it as. Whereas on the other end, where I think a lot of our channel plays in the uh, solution uh, game, which is complexity. It is sitting down, it's what we call, internally we call it the considered sale. The considered sale means we are gonna sit down and talk about businesses, we're going to architect something together. Uh, that is very different than pointing and clicking and saying, I need 27 licenses of this. Mm -hmm. It is saying, here are my business needs, what should I be thinking about? That's a very different engagement. And to say, you know, I can go to some online digital store and just pull off the shelf something, uh, it, it, I think it, it, it ignores what the Accentures and the Deloittes are doing of the world. You know, these $50 billion companies that, that live due to complexity. And that's where we see the, these partners rising up to is these engagements where we need to sit down and have a real conversation, an augmented conversation. We're gonna bring technology and research and all these things to a business that is making a critical decision where jobs are on the line, uh, the business outcome is, is critical for, for uh, many people and, and jobs are, are at stake, uh, where we're gonna have a, a conversation, we're gonna plan out and architect something. That's very hard to do with a point and click. Can be augmented, mm -hmm. but I think it's the, the reason the partners around to stay is just like Deloitte and Accenture have demonstrated to us, people need help. They need help from an expert when they're making big decisions that happen every couple of years. You know, and support what you're saying, Adam, we ran a, um, uh, a survey with uh, SMB businesses in uh, 2021, and the results were overwhelming. We asked them uh, whether what, what kind of ROI they were getting from working with the technology advisors, and 96% of the SMB just said, I get a great ROI by working through technology. Advisor. So, you know, I know that years ago there was concern that mark the advent of marketplace and cloud technology would displace or disintermediate the channel partner. It's not happening. And based on a survey we ran in the last four months, the, that's still the message that's coming from the SMB. I, I totally agree that marketplaces, you know, augment. Um, the, the, the overall experience. And what we're seeing mostly, and we're seeing tremendous growth on the marketplace, but to Adam's point, we are seeing it in SaaS solutions that are typically seat-based. As you get into more complex solutions into the data center, 
uh, where there's usage and complex configurations that are required, and same on the on the telecom side. Then you know obviously the the sales engineering, the uh, the technology architecture cannot be replaced by a marketplace. But I think it's really you know the two coming together that create a, a, a super compelling value proposition for channel partner and gives them the ability to better service their customers. Yeah, Adam kind of nailed it. You know, it, as technology keeps evolving, it, it becomes complex for a lot of people, especially the end user customer. There's certainly going to be a subset of solutions out there that are transactional or licensed or usage based that could be sold from a marketplace. But I think the partner community has shown that they like the engagement. They like to reach out and touch someone and feel the support from our suppliers. Yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'll just put it simply. I mean, I, I, I think that there's a place for marketplace, but maybe not necessarily in the channel that we play in every day. Um, when it's complexity and everyone is completely different. I mean, look at the unified communication space. There's a ton of players and it's not just click, 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 add to cart and hope it goes great. Um, that just doesn't exist. And I think a lot of people thought that maybe that would get like that, but it never did, right? You can buy Zoom licenses and you can get a video license and up and running, you have video. But if you want to integrate 500 seats, 1,000 seats of you know, real true voice capabilities integrated inside of your CRM that's going to do things that you could never imagine before, this takes people. You know, I think it goes back, Josh, to the earlier point, like people glued to technology with that advisor engineers that we all you know obviously offer mm. uh and high-end engineers and it's not getting any more complex it's getting super complex um and i think that's the best part about this business because it's arming with the trusted advisors an opportunity of a lifetime sure let's talk a little bit now about uh, the growth of the channel um how attractive is in, is the indirect sales model now and, and how fast are you guys seeing the, the channel grow? Justin, what are you seeing? Oh, I love this question, Josh. Um, I think where maybe I differ a little bit from the other panelists, uh, you know, I spent the lion's share of my career as just a channel manager and working directly and supporting partners. And I think back to 15 years ago when the channel was kind of the redheaded stepchild of this industry and you couldn't get direct and channel in a room together with it probably turning into a scene at a West Side story with everyone snapping. So we've evolved, right? I mean, you see our providers uh, focus more attention and resources toward the channel. We see them de decommissioning direct sales resources to focus more on the channel. Uh, when we look at the compensation, um, it's certainly more competitive today than, than we're used to it being uh, when you think back 15 years ago. So we're in a great place. And uh, I only see that that place accelerating as we go forward. Yeah, I mean, I'll jump in. I mean, it, it's, it's like nothing I could have ever even imagined, you know, when we started the company uh, almost 13 years ago. Um, it's exploding. And there's a reason behind, behind that. You know, I think uh, a great example, I, I, I'm in here today with my chief strategy officer, uh, Alex Daniluk, and I got an email from one of the probably the top cybersecurity minds I've met in the industry, bar none, uh, at any company, uh, send me a, a, a text message saying, it's my time now. I'm ready to be a trusted advisor in this space. I cannot miss this opportunity. I think every time we go out and present in front of a massive community, people that work at the providers are saying, I want to get in this game from the trusted provider perspective. Um, and I think it's because of the opportunity at hand. Every company needs help. As a service is the new first. Every company is looking for their digital twin. Uh, and I think that you're going to see from birthing of new trusted advisors explosion, which we're seeing currently today, you're seeing the, you know, the folks that maybe worked with Justin 15 years ago, um, now wanting to evolve into a different type of trusted advisor, taking advantage of things like cybersecurity and other complex technologies that exist. Um, this is only accelerating. I believe, and I think Adam and I have talked about this at times, we're in like the first inning. Uh, we're in the very first inning or the maybe 
you know, nearing the second inning uh, of our industry. Uh, and it's going to be explosive. Where are these new guys coming from? Where, where are you guys seeing the new, the new partners? Cause obviously, you know, a lot of the old school guys, you know, they they came out of the original Select explosion and the, the huge boom of recruiting that those guys did. And, you know, they had a ton of money behind them to drive that recruiting um, things obviously are going to have to change. Those, those guys are retiring more and more. Where, where are you guys seeing the growth in the indirect channel come from? Is it more people or, or maybe fewer people driving more business? What, what, what are you seeing, Adam? You know, I'll tell you, it's interesting when, when you look at the expansion of the channel, it is on, on really four vectors. You're seeing it grow uh, geographically, you know, internationally, you're seeing it grow in terms of product set. The, the diverse set of products we're selling, I mean, 15 years ago, we're selling long distance and, uh, you know, T1s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but you're also seeing, custom, you know, company size, the enterprise level. And so the entrance, what's interesting to your question about the entrance in the channel, they are more sophisticated, more capable, because what, what partners have done for these last 20 years, they have legitimized this, this space. They have said, you know what, it's, it's, not just, it's, it's not just someone trying to go in and get a, a commission on their brother-in-law's circuit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but these are real professionals. These are people that come in and advise and have seen something over and over and they're going to advise you. So now we're seeing entrance, you know, of, of people with commercial real estate backgrounds of, you know what, I've helped these enterprises before. I know what their concerns are. And I think it can help with, with technology as well. We're seeing people who came from an Accenture or a Deloitte. We're seeing professional technologists come in and say, you know what, I think I've got something to share. I could help these people. And I really like the business model. So it is not just, you know, uh, when, when I think the largest influx came through of, you know, the, the former CLEP folks of, hey, my, you, you hose me in my comp plan, you're raising my commission again, I'm going to go be an agent. Um, we, we are seeing, you know, lots of different types coming in, but I would say overall, the level is rising. And I would say, I think it's a lot of investment on both sides, not just the caliber of people coming in, but it's the existing partners who have raised their game. They've reached out to brokerages and gone to educational events and used tools and used engineers, which, hey, kudos to them. They should be taking advantage of all of these opportunities to raise their game. But, but what that does for everybody else is it raises the game and breeds better interest. So just like the American Dental Association, the medical, like the bar, what those are professional organizations are doing is they legitimize that profession and, and, and thereby increase the value in people's eyes. And I believe that's going on in this industry right now is the evolution that we're seeing of these partners are getting bigger, better, more sophisticated, not just new entrants, but existing partners. And that's what uh, we want to continue having a, a hand in, uh, just like our peers are having a hand in. Let's educate these folks. Let's put tools in their hands because we're going to raise the, the uh, you know, raise the tide for everybody. So are those new entrants um... You know, I, I know that Renee referred before to um, ISVs and MSPs and those sorts of guys. Are, are you guys seeing that the new entrants are more, uh, I hesitate to use the word sophisticated because that implies that the, the loan consultant is not sophisticated and that's not what I mean, but, uh, you know, kind of organize, organizations that are plugging it into their team or are you guys still seeing, because obviously back in the day, um, there were a lot of, you know, sort of trunk banger one man shows that we're out to, to conquer the world is, has that profile changed as the product set and the advisory role has evolved? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. When you think back, it was more IT, you know, call it IT telecom technology consultants, uh, interconnects were the primary partners out there. And in today's world, uh, VARs, MSPs, IT solution providers, SIs, you know, the, the, the growth is back behind the expansion of the partner community, you know, even throwing in like, you know, commercial real estate brokers. I mean, there's so many opportunities out there for people in business to be a trusted advisor for their end user customers. It complementary to that, it's the technology, right? As we see more and more services moves to the cloud become as a service, you combine those two things together, that's really the foundation behind the growth over the last few years. Yeah, it's really coming from anybody that has great relationships, that understands the value of this business and what it means to their business. You know, I mean, those are all good examples. You're even seeing the VAR community. You know, we have a, a tremendous background in the VAR community, and you're seeing this become, you know, an absolute needle mover with some of the largest VARs on the planet. 
you're seeing some of the biggest consulting companies that were generally doing one-time payment consulting engagements uh, move into this arena as well. Um, and so it's really coming from anywhere and everywhere. Um, and I think even the traditional trusted advisor, the, the circuit folks back in the day, that, that we didn't have a lot of them, but we're seeing them now completely transition into a much more sophisticated company uh, that's helping their end customer really navigate the market out there today. And they have to, Drew, right? Because if they don't, they're not going to be able to keep up with the newer, as Josh put it, more sophisticated partners. And it's not, surprising if you think, it's not surprising if you think about it, because the buyer of the technology at the end customer level have changed, right? In 15 years ago, 20 years ago, it was an IT manager that was buying the technology. But more and more, CIOs are business leaders, and it's the actual business leader that's making a lot of the technology decision. Therefore, you know, it's opening the door to um, what we call business advisors. And you know, they're not necessarily from a technology heritage, but they have great relationships. Selling products could be commercial properties, you were saying, Adam, we're seeing you know, accountants, legal, all kinds of professional services, businesses starting to influence the purchase of technology by businesses and acting as an advisor. So, you know, that was, we're seeing a lot of these in, uh, in the new entrance in the channel. Hmm. So, so we've got this growing um, partner base, the profile of those partners is changing when it comes to kind of the, the day-to-day um, sales focus for them. What, which technologies do you all see as being most in demand from a customer perspective, if you can even kind of whittle that down. Uh, like what should these guys be selling? You know, I, uh, go ahead, Adam. I'll, 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 I'll bite. Um, the, the, <laughs> the very unsatisfying answer, Josh, is it depends. You know, yeah. if, if you've already got the relationship and you sold technology A into that customer, then it's time to sell technology B. So really, it doesn't matter, you know, necessarily what the hot thing is. Sometimes the hot thing, we found that IoT tended to be more of a door opener, but the real sale was mobility. Nobody wanted to have mobility. It's not very sexy. IoT is sexy. But was yeah. that really sold? No, it was a conversation. It was a conversation about asset tracking. It was a conversation about data. Uh, but ultimately, where the money really came from was mobility. And it's massive. And so I, I think you've got to separate between what's marketing and what's reality. And, and the marketing is whatever it takes you to get in the door of, I can help you with your problem. So fishing out what that pain point, that problem is, sitting down with the customer. And it really depends. It may be dependent on what they recently purchased and they're having problems with or what could augment their recent purchase if it's an existing customer. Um, but but the, the nice thing is we've got so many answers. We don't want to pre, pre-subscribe, you know, it, Look, any conversation without security, I think, is malpractice right now. Security is always going to be a part of the conversation, but it's probably not the big money maker uh, that that uh, is going to lead the deal. It's going to be an element of it. So, again, the unsatisfying answer is it depends. I think the tough part is, let, let's say you had a new partner, you know, someone who hasn't been in the indirect channel. Let's say it's an MSP. Um, they're excited. They, they just um, signed up with Tolaris and they sit down and they go, what do I do? How do I get started in this? And and I think yeah. some sometimes it's it's hard to say. Well, you know, it depends. Let's look at all these different things. So, you know, how how do you guys? You ever notice how in high that? school it was always D, all the above, right? Like that <laughs> that happened to always be the right answer, and it really Could comes be why down I to do the, so well. I mean, always D, always D. Um, it it really comes down to the client, right? What are their needs, and, and that's always going to dictate the conversation. I don't think anyone goes out goes to market with the strategy of leading with a specific technology. You could be very familiar with something and by default, that's often what you talk about. But in today's world, um, any strategic partner is keeping their eyes and ears open for any opportunity because that could sometimes be the foot in the door with the client. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah, I think so, you know, like, all of us have got a, a ton of um, enablement material for solutions and advisors say, certainly taking advantage of it. But at the end of the day, the advisor that you know we see growing tremendously are the ones that are spending time understanding their customer's goal and their customer's business problem and solving them through technology. And the fun part about that is that that brings those advisors into different areas of the technology and it is possible today even if you're a small technology advisor it's because you're working with a partners like, like Avant or Sandler's or Talaris or AppSmart or others right we're we're bringing a ton of capability to make mm -hmm. those small partners able to work across multiple technology so Drew how does how does Avant tackle that yeah, so, you know, it, it's, a, it's a good question. And I know you probably wanted us to all say like UCAS or CCAS or something no. like that, right? Um, but it's, I would it's have not. doubted so, you if you had said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So everything is changing. I will say, you know, kind of teeing off a little bit from uh, from Adam's point, we, we're, we're now saying job zero, which is job zero is everything starts at job zero. That's cybersecurity. If you don't have a mindset in cybersecurity, it's malpractice. It's a great one. I'll steal that one from you, Adam. But um it's a great way to describe it, right? We all, I think, need to have a cybersecurity mindset in everything we do. But if you look at the main pillars that we all focus on, let's call it telecommunications, it's going through a massive change, right? You're not out there selling T1s and 10 meg ethernet connections and private lines and MPLS today. You're selling something completely different. And if anything, you're ripping and replacing what you've currently been doing inside of that account for something better. The same goes for the data center, the same goes for the cloud, the same goes for now cybersecurity. And we all represent the coolest thing about this industry and what I want everybody to be so excited about, and I know everybody that's on this panel is, we represent everyone that is as a service. And that is where the market is going. Everyone that has been as an end customer kind of running the same playbook for the last 10 years, they're terminally ill and they don't even know it. They need to find the digital twins inside of their organizations. And so we're building tools and technology and hiring people to allow them to listen for the business problems that occur in those silos. And I think that's the explosive growth. So there is no easy answer. They're all going through rapid rates of change, but they're going through those changes to what we all represent uh, as platforms, You know, whether it's telecommunications and the new technology there, data centers, cloud, and now cybersecurity. So, um, you know, when it comes to those, those opportunities and you mentioned um, tools that are available to the partners, what, how do you help them find and win those opportunities? So you've got this, this new partner, what sort of resources um, do they get from or should they get from their TSB in, in order to be successful there? Renee, what, yeah. what, what do you think? I mean, this, 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 go, go ahead, ahead Renee. Now go ahead, you go ahead. You know, th this is what should separate all of us, right? And I, and I think this is the thing that, you know, where to us, this is where we're investing in, right? You think about things that we're building like Pathfinder. Uh, Pathfinder is, you know, clearly a tool that allows you to walk through in front of a customer, all of these different areas to identify the problems that they think that they have. You know, things like research and analytics. I think somebody needed to come out and quite honestly, give uh, an argument to people that are writing book reports in a rearview mirror uh, and to give the trusted advisors analytics that we're all seeing that the end customer is not seeing. You know, it's like people, we're investing in people like, you know, our new head of cybersecurity, for instance, who uh, is helping lead the conversation to walk the trusted advisor through. Uh, and then, you know, other tools like our Planet One acquisition, which we're so thankful for right now. That acquisition, their back office, the ability to white glove, all the things that they, every trusted advisor wants in order to be able to scale this business. So um, the list is going to be growing, I think, over the next couple of years, more and more and more to arm the trusted advisors to take advantage of the movement. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, you know, what we try to do is really kind of map the end to end trusted advisor journey 
in the different categories of solution and identify all the tools they need in order to be successful, you know, uncover the opportunity um, and then, uh, you know, architect the solution, propose it, and um, eventually, you know, win and support the deal. You know, when you think of a platform, you can't just think about the transaction. Um, the platform is all of these different elements coming together, all of these tool sets. And that's certainly where we're investing a lot. What about you guys, Justin? So in, in, in the Sandler world, what, yeah, what, does, so what does a partner get to help them be successful there? So... I feel like, you know, I've had a look under the covers from what most of my competition has. And I think it's safe to say that we all have our sales enablement tools, right? Whether they're called Pathfinder or Solution Finder or Cable Finder or whatever finder, um, we there's somewhat table stakes in, in, in the industry today. And um, we all stand behind what we have to offer our partners. And complementary to that, it's resources, it's engineering resources, it's you know, a great channel management team. Um, I don't think I've necessarily seen any of us doing anything that's much different than the other, right? We all may just call it a little something different from a solution technology finder perspective. Um, but, you know, we all do a really great job of providing those resources to our partner community. I, 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 I would agree with that. I think that there are very different levels of investment that have taken place. I think people have taken different paths. I believe that what AppSmart has done is unique. I think it's different, that they have created a, an online marketplace to enable uh, partners to have a store that is selling different products. I believe that is differentiated. Uh, I believe what Avant uh, has done is a first, something that's been talked about a lot, but their research uh, department, I believe is a first, that's different. I believe all of it's for the same aim to enable our partners to do better. But I think what Sandler has staked its claim on is commissions, that we're gonna make sure that we find every single dollar. Um, but I, I do think there are different flavors and people align with different uh, brokerages. One, because of the personalities, that the, the, the local personalities they, they align with, but two, because of the brand promise and where those investments are placed. And I believe that's gonna to continue to differentiate. Certainly we, we influence one another, but I believe at the end of the day, what, what the brokerage is going to become is a business enablement, not just a sales enablement, but a business enablement company. I'm amazed at the HR conversations we're having about hiring process, the legal conversations we're having about uh, you know, how to contract with, with a customer for a consulting agreement and, and what the protocol should be. We're having uh, financial projection conversations of if I sell at this current rate and shore up my attrition, what will my business look like in five years? Those are business enablement conversations. And that's what I view our role as collectively. I think we've taken different paths, similar objective, but I think people have placed different bets. And I believe that when a partner is placing an order, what they're doing is they're voting. I believe they're voting on what is the best value to them. Is it an extra point of commission? Maybe, because if it's all the same and I'm not asking for any value long-term you know, out of the sale, then I'm going to maximize commission. If it's, no, I need a long-term relationship here because of the goodness I'm going to get back, then they're placing a bet. They're placing a vote every time they place an order. And I think they're voting on what value proposition, what collection of uh, assets that these brokers have created Mean, are meaningful to them. And that's what I, I think yeah, is take, is the giant- could not, could not agree with Adam more, couldn't disagree with Justin more. Um, and I only say that respectively because it is not the same. None of us are the same. You know, we're completely customer front facing, right? We are the, we, we want to build weapons for you to differentiate you in the marketplace in a way that no one else can. On the back office, there were some areas that we wanted to strengthen. That was the reason why we went out and acquired Planet One and their incredible back office support, the ability to do things that we couldn't do on some of the lower end products and some of the products that we weren't you know, a leader in, now we are. And so I, I would tell you that when you do peel back the covers, you'll see a vastly different, we're all box of chocolates, we're completely different. You know, Talaris and Avant, they're still very different. They have different products that serve different needs to different trusted advisors. But it's those investments that we're putting into it. We can't invest in those fast enough to help the trusted advisors truly scale at what the market is scaling at. You know, I think 
for us, when we went out and received, you know, capital, it was because we couldn't believe how big the industry was getting. We couldn't believe, Josh, you know, to your point, how many trusted advisors were being birthed. We couldn't believe the types of birthing that were needed. And an EY is going to need different tool set than a five-man shop that has a focus primarily on just unified communications. And so we have to serve all needs. And I think that's the investments you're going to see and the differences in the different platforms that exist today. And I think that's why sometimes the commissions, we're not relying on commissions as a, as a tool set to win customers over. We're relying on people, tools, technology, process. And to Adam's point, like the HR, you know, we'll help these companies also because we've grown so much in 13 years, when to hire, who to hire, what are the right types of hires. And so, you know, building true businesses with the tool set that we have that's what's important right now to take advantage of this movement. Yeah, I appreciate the disagreement, folks. And, uh, you know, it, it's, we're definitely different in our own rights. We all have the same mind of putting tools and resources in place to help our partners. I'm pretty confident that all of us have the ability to have strong business conversations with our partners and offer legal guidance on contracts. I mean, if not for anything else, I think that's one of the things that they rely on us for. Um, and we all call our tools something a little bit different and some have invested more than others. And, and like you, I would encourage any partner out there to have a conversation with any one of us, if not all of us, before making a decision. You know, we talk a lot about um, tools, investments in tools for the advisors. And, and yes, we've invested differently, uh, but I think all of us have, have definitely demonstrated a huge commitment in, in the form of the investments we've made. But I think we also have to be more and more conscious of making the right investments at the end customer level. So um, I know that when I say that, it makes a lot of channel partner nervous. You know, what is AppSmart talking about? Are they gonna go after end customer? We're not. I wanna just put any, um, any, any concerns to rest. We're 100% channel company. But it's critically important, especially as you get into the cloud, to deliver the right experience to the end customer, to ensure that they adopt the solution and to ensure that they're successful with the solution. So, you know, we're investing in tools that we believe are going to create even more loyalty between the end customer and the technology advisors by creating a unique experience at the end customer level that's gonna allow them to adopt the technology successfully. Whether it's a single sign-on capability, access management, analytics, uh, to make sure that they're using their solution and really um, benefiting from them. Uh, those are different kinds of tool set that we, we believe is kind of the next gen in tools um, really devoted to the end customer experience. Awesome, so I wanted to go back to something that um that Adam said, uh, you, you made the comment that partners are sort of voting with their order flow, so to speak. Um, and I know that it, there, there's increasingly a request by TSBs for partners to be exclusive, um, which, which sort of means they, they wouldn't necessarily have the, the ability to vote after they made that agreement. But I'm curious um, how many of you guys are, are asking for exclusivity of your partners? Um, are they agreeing to it? And, and what's the thought process behind it and how has it impacted growth? Does it work? I'll just jump right in. I, I don't think I've, I know for a fact, I've never asked for exclusivity. I feel like, you know, our approach is we want to earn that partner's business. Um, there's an investment on both sides and I would never put a gun to somebody's head and kind of, you know, put them in a position to only do business with me, right? We know it's a competitive environment and we are confident in our team and our sales enablement resources and our engineering resources to earn that partner's business. Who does request exclusivity on this panel? Nobody. We don't. No, we don't, we don't. You know, I think that if I was a channel partner, I'd be concerned um with with anyone you know um, i mean I, I think the i think the logic is we're making an investment in the partner therefore we expect that i so i 
I'll, I'll give those that do request it the benefit of the doubt. So sorry to, sorry to cut you off for now. Keep, I, keep going. No, no, I, I mean, I'd love for all of our advisors to be exclusive through us, but to Justin's point, I'd like for them to want to be exclusive uh, to us because we deliver unique value that allows them to meet their goal, right? I, I don't know of any, um, of any uh, brokers that uh, ask for exclusivity. You know, um, Josh, I think it's absolutely happening. And what, what's taking place is really interesting to me. This is a shift in the last three years that, I, that, that we should bring to the service. And, and I don't think it's just about exclusivity. Partners are looking for a brand to align with. You know, I think Avant was very forward looking and putting their brand, you know, out in front as a powered buy where the mm -hmm. partner's brand can shine. But partners are saying, look, I'm walking into a situation. I'm getting walked out the door because Accenture rolls in with a mm. team of 13 and I need someone behind me. So we asked a question just recently to some of our top partners, you know, wh where should our brand fit? Do you want a powered by? Uh, it's a very different temperature uh, or attitude today than it was three years ago. Three years ago, it was, hey, you stay out of the way. I just want you in the background. I'll talk to your engineers, we'll whiteboard together, mm. but this is me, this is my brand. There's a shift taking place right now where partners are aligning, hey, I'm an Upstack partner. And I, with that brand, I'm going to be able to do, hey, I'm a Bridgepoint partner, because with that brand, I'm going to be able to do more. That's going to open doors for me. Hey, I'm powered by Avant, you know, that, that brand, they're now seeing that as an asset of should I align myself? And the conversations we're hearing about exclusivity align around, think about it, if you're putting your brand out there as a brokerage, then you better have some sort of commitment. Because if some yokel who doesn't know what they're talking about is wearing your brand and mucks it up for everybody else out there, for your entire population of partners, you got a real problem on your hands. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. conversation about brand, I think, is coming to the forefront. People aligning more deeply uh, with, with the brokerage, I think, is a forefront of conversation. And, and I think we're at the tip of that right now. That's going to be a very active conversation over the next year or two. Agree. And yeah. I think, you know, if you, I mean, if you go to our website, it's got nothing to do with about commissions or finding commissions or finding errors in commissions. It's about CIOs and CTOs and research and analytics to help the trusted advisors. I think you're kidding yourself if we don't all work on behalf of the trusted advisors to earn exclusivity. You know, it's a two way street. You know, I think that I never really understood why people don't try to challenge for exclusivity, right? I, it's our goal with every single customer because we want to do whatever it takes to help that trusted advisor double their business. And we're gonna invest in them with tools and people and process and technology in a way that you can't imagine. And I think it's a goal of ours. I think to Adam's point, we're seeing it. We're seeing a lot of exclusive uh, customers that are leaning 100% in on us, that are using our tools. Because a lot of the customers are asking some of the trusted advisors, where did you get that research and analytics? Where did you get that tool that's not like everyone else's? Um, you know, and I think they're saying we're powered by a platform like Avant. And I think you're seeing that in the VAR space. You've seen that over years and years and years. VARs, they ask where it comes from. It comes from you know, Renee's old company, Ingram. It comes from Aero. It comes from what have you. You're seeing that now. And aligning with the right brands is key because they're a direct selling entity out there, whereas we're powering that internally. So I think we're gonna always strive for exclusivity because we do believe you know, what we're building, what we're doing is so vastly different and that the commission split that you're getting through us is going to be so worth it because we wanna double your business every year. We don't wanna keep you doing what you've always done. We wanna help you double your business. And I would say to everyone listening, you know, 30%, it's kind of the magic number, you know, and trusted advisors, you should know too, right? Are you growing at 30% year over year or higher, right? Lean in with the ones that are doing that already, because that's the new trend. That's what investors are looking at. That's what smart money's looking at. And I think it's those ones that are aligned the most to Adam's point. I agree with it. Getting behind the brand, getting behind a company. I think exclusivity will happen more and more. So I guess it's my time to disagree with my peers a little bit. And I just don't see partners aligning with a brand. I see them aligning with people. And we talked about that early on and how it's people that they invest in. And I would hope somebody doesn't do business with me and says, I work with Sandler. I want them to say, I work with Justin. 
And I think our team members want us to say the same because that's the value that they bring to the organization. And I don't know if I'd necessarily ever challenge someone to just be exclusive with me out of the gate. I go back to, I'd want to earn it every step of the way. And I'd want them to come to me and tell me that somebody's doing something that I'm not so I could get better, faster, stronger, and smarter in my approach to how we earn their business. Yeah, the difference is we're not asking, we're trying to earn it. And so I think that that is, yeah, I did. And so we're, we're a hundred percent committed to earning that. And I think any partner would want that out of a relationship that they would have. Yeah. I think we think exclusivity in terms of contract, but that's not what we're talking about. Right. And I think that the investment in the tool set and the experience of the advisors are indeed reinforcing channel partners, advisors working with fewer, if not exclusive a broker, you know, whether it's Pathfinder or our marketplace, as they get familiar with the tool, as they get comfortable with the tool, as they're getting value out of it, then it's going to be natural for them to be uh, putting more business through this because it, be- it becomes their own uh, business environment, right? It becomes an extension of their own back office system or front office system, much more importantly. So I do think the investments that all of us have made are, you know, really driving a more exclusive relationship with advisors. Awesome. Outstanding, everybody. We're, um, looks like we're right at the top of the hour. This has been a a really fascinating conversation. Um, I can't thank you guys enough for, for taking the time to participate. Um, Of course, have to thank Airspring for making this happen. Uh, It sounds like change remains the defining characteristic of our industry. Um, And I, I know I look forward to seeing how, how we'll all continue to evolve. So I'll um, hand it back over to Ellen now to to close for us. Well, thank you. This was excellent, everybody. I I enjoyed it. And I really hope that trusted advisors on this call were listening very carefully and taking a lot internally to to, uh, advance their businesses. You gave a lot of great advice and I thank each and every one of you. You all have great organizations and anybody would be fortunate to be doing business through either of you. And um, you know, through your disc- disc- description of how the industry has changed, where it's going, the importance of relationships, tools, and technology, always to be learning. I mean, very key points that sometimes people, people lose sight of and, uh, and giving them the tools that they need to do that. Some of these firms, as you know, are smaller, don't have those resources. They can't pay a gardener or a forester uh, for that type of research and reports. And, and they really look to leaders in the channel. So if you're in the channel, you should be very excited right now because this is only gonna get better, much, much better. So again, thank you all. And for those on the call, the attendees, this was recorded and we'll have it available for replay. So everyone, thank you so much. This was wonderful. I can't thank you enough. Thank you. Thanks all. Thanks everybody. Thanks everybody. This was fun. There it is again. Yeah. <laughs>